Out of curiosity, what is the um, the hard stuff you guys want to put on the class? Like 4.30 or 4? Or how's everyone feeling about that? It's really up to you guys. 5.45. I mean, I can, I can go all night if you guys want to. I got lots of things to say. Good stuff to do. Okay. I mean, it depends. If you guys don't want a hard stop, we can keep going. I just don't want to make sure. I want to make sure that I'm not, uh, you know, overstaying my welcome here. And I want to make sure we cover the material that you guys want to cover. And if you guys want to definitely be out by 430, I just want to make sure uh, we prioritize the material in the order that that suits your needs. I'll probably cut out around 430, but. Okay. Um, so some things I'm going to talk about are sort of general auditing strategies, okay, and sort of like Corey's um, source code auditing tips. Um, we're also going to talk about exploit mitigation technology. And the last lab that I have planned is one where we bypass depth and no execute stack. So there we go, exploit mitigation technologies, bypassing mitigation technologies, and uh, source code auditing tips. Out of those three, which two are the most interesting to you guys? First two. First two? Okay. All right, let's do it. So your doctor saying uh, Corey's uh, source code auditing tips and exploit mitigations. What was the third one? Breaking exploit mitigations. Um, the third one. Yeah, third one. I need. All right. All right. Okay, let's do it then. Let's go. All right, so when you're auditing an application, and I'm trying to mainly talk about open source stuff, for closed source stuff, uh, please see my second class this summer. But for open source stuff, it is largely um, target dependent, okay? It depends on what it is you're auditing. If you're auditing something like OpenSSH, Apache, something that has wide peer review, um, you need to go into the battle knowing what to expect. If it has been widely peer reviewed, do not expect to find string copy buffer overflows. It's not going to exist. Everyone has already rooted those out a long time ago. If you're looking at something that um, a lot of people have looked at it, you will need to look at the very crazy, nasty functions um, like this and so on to try to find the vulnerabilities because these are much harder to spot, right? A lot of people have looked at them, so the only bugs left are the ones that are very hard to spot. If you're auditing something for a sponsor, or something that has had very little peer review, just something that um, you know some guy wrote, and yeah, it's very possible that you'll find a very obvious buffer overflow, like a screen copy, as printf, something like that. I assume there's like Perl scripts and tools out there that look at, analyze source code. And look Next slide. Oh, okay. uh, actually, uh, a couple slides away. I'll go and talk about that now, though. There are some open source, some tools that you can feed your source code to, and they will automatically try to find vulnerabilities for you. Rule number one, most of them suck, OK? I'm just being real with you about that. Uh, so for instance, I guess that's actually not the slide I'm going to show you. There you go. Uh, this is one of those automated source code analyzers. I ran it in a simple login program, which, as you know, is pretty simple. It's probably just like 15 lines of code. And look at this, it actually produces more output than there are lines of code. Pretty much impossible to sift through. The signal to noise ratio is insane. The, whole, the false positive ratio is insane as well. However, this was just a free source code analyzer, OK? There are some companies out there that will be happy to charge you $50,000 um, for their super advanced, awesome uh, source code analyzer. Uh, I've seen some demos of some of them. They are kind of interesting. Um, but And they're good at finding some kinds of bugs, like they'll warn you for using unsafe functions like string copy or uh, sprintf. But it is likely that even those would fail to find something like this, OK? It's just um, it's kind of like the halting problem. Some of these things are just, uh, I think, too hard for a program to find. It's, uh, I can't obviously say definitively because I haven't bought the million dollar source code analyzer, but from my experience, they're just uh, not going to find really severe bug or really uh, subtle bugs like this. Obviously, they are useful if you are incorporating them into your software development process, that everyone's code has to pass through you know, this code analyzer, and that will root out some bugs, certainly, and make your code quality better. But you can't assume because the source of the analyzer found no bugs that there are no bugs. 
at the end of the day, when you use one of those things, we'll probably get a, uh, you know, insane amount of uh, signal to noise or yeah, signal to noise ratio. It's going to be really hard to parse. So, you know, pros and cons there. It's not going to find everything for you. Will help you. Is it worth the insane price as uh, those people charge? It's up to you. Uh, another thing you can do that a lot of people just find bugs these days is uh, fuzzing, right? We've all heard of that. So the way fuzzing works is you have two, I guess, two main categories, all right? You have generational fuzzing and mutational fuzzing. So let's assume, as an example, kind of come over to the board here, Bill. Let's assume that I am fuzzing a um, document reader, like the... Uh, Linux PDF reader, okay? XPDF or something like that. You're not on the screen yet. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you, Bill. So let's assume I'm um, fuzzing something like XPDF, the Linux PDF reader, uh, for vulnerabilities. What I would do to fuzz a target, just to um, walk you through a scenario, is first off, I would go and write a Python script to download a million random PDFs on the internet, something like that, okay? So I have a, a sample size of like 1 million well-formed PDFs. These are all good, legit PDFs, okay? Now here's what I do. I have a, um, a Python script that comes and loads in one of these files. So x from here, I'm just choosing one at random, okay? The contents of X are, and I'm making this up because I'm not intimately familiar with the PDF format, are some, you know, we'll just assume it's binary data. We have this here, and these first two bytes just signify, it's a, a PDF document, it's like a signature that has to be checked if the first two bytes are not A, B, B, it is not a PDF document. Here we have some, uh, some more data, 0, 0, 1, 0, a, F, and this is treated like a, um, an integer or something. This declares some kind of size. I don't know. I'm just thinking of the file format. We have more binary data here. Blah, 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 blah. One, one, two, two. More binary data, pictures, and all this kind of crap. And what your fuzzing script would do for um, mutational fuzzing is it would take all this well formed data and it would mutate it. It would come in and it would randomly change some of these bytes. And each iteration it would change, I don't know, like 50 bytes or some random number like that. And then it would tell XPDF to, uh, to load this document that I just got, so x.xpdf. So it makes a mutation, then it goes xpdf x.pdf, you know, it tries to load it, and it has a, and it checks to see if this crashed, if a core file was created, okay? Um, if it crashes, it logs the crash and which file caused the crash, and maybe some, like, a register information, the time of the crash, and so on. And then it, um, whether or not it crashes, it reinserts this into our sample size, so now we have a million and one. And it does this 100 times a second, um, for a whole week or something like this. And at the end of the week, you have found, you know, like a thousand crashes, probably more like 10,000. Just by taking all these well formed PDF and randomly changing byte data in here, all right, and then forcing the PDF player to try to parse it. And then what you do is you have 10,000 crashes and you have to decide which of these are exploitable and which are just. Uh, bogus crashes like uh, null pointer dereference or something like this. And you'll get somewhere between like 1 and 4% are exploitable. And there you go. Now you have like 10 to 40 um, exploitable PDF bugs. And all you've done is taken this um, sample size of good PDFs, flipped some data in here, flipped some bytes, made it try to run it, log if there was a crash or not, and then analyze the uh, source of your crashes. Obviously, you would want to try to script the, um, 
the parsing of these crashes to triage them faster. I talk about this actually in my Exploits 2 class, and the last day will be dedicated just to doing a lab like this, where we fuzz an application this method this way. And then we have a bunch of exploitable crashes. Uh, this is mutational. We're taking good PDFs and just flipping the data. Generational would be, in which is the other uh, kind, mutational and generational. Generational means I understand the um, file format well enough where I can generate one of my own. So I know that these first two bytes are static. This is like a signature. It has to be the same. I know that this is some two-byte number value that's used as like a, you know, an allocation amount to allocate. So, you know, integer. I know that this is an ASCII string, et cetera. And then basically what happens is you create a template file for, okay, I'm going to mutationally or generationally fuzz this document. I know that this has to be AABB. That's static. I know that next is an integer, and its range is 0 to 1,000 or something like that. I just know that that's the valid range by fuzzing, by reverse engineering the document format. I also know that the next two things I see are ASCII strings that can be between 1 and 100 characters long and are null terminated. And I know I have um, another integer here and some JPEG information here and so on. And you describe this like an XML format or something like that is what you often see in Fuzzers. And, um, you will generate a bunch of documents that fit this specification, okay? It's going to randomly choose an integer between this range, um, uh, randomly generate an ASCII screen that fits these criteria, and it's going to keep generating and uh, trying to get XPDF to play them. And then uh, eventually you'll end up with a bunch of crashes as well. And obviously this method is a little bit harder because it requires that you understand the file format enough to be able to describe it in this manner. That's often kind of hard. You have to reverse engineer the program to do that. Whereas with uh, Generational fuzzing, you have to just create, collect a large sample of these PDFs, and then you can just change them a little bit, you keep changing and changing and changing and see what happens. And um, of course, you're probably asking yourself, does this actually work? Is this totally bogus? What course is telling me? And uh, hell yes, it works, is um, the answer to your question. I actually did this just for fun. Just, first of all, I read a paper, I don't know, a couple years ago, where a guy fuzzed a lot of. Uh, client-side formats, uh, like client-side document parsers, like in Microsoft Office and Adobe, using this exact same method, and found a whole bunch of uh, vulnerabilities. This was a couple years ago. And I was sort of curious about making this process work as well. Um, so I did it myself, or like the uh, you know Linux PDF reader, open source PDF reader, or something like that, just to see what would happen. And yeah, I got like a bajillion crashes, OK? So this method definitely does work. And um, some percentage of those will end up being exploitable. So it's kind of just like, a, you know, troll fishing for vulnerabilities, just making the computer do all the work for you. And then my, uh, like I said, my exploit two class will go through that process and kind of do that with a um, application that I wrote. That will kind of make sense to people, that process. Okay, uh, here's another example of a fuzzer that was used in Linux, um, fuzzing for environment variables. Basically, uh, back in the day, like 2001, people were discovering that there were a lot of upper overflows in environment variables, like your home and path variable. And so there's this dumb fuzzer that basically replaces your environment variables with a you know, bazillion A's, and it tries to run a bunch of applications. Some of those will crash. It's usually indicative of a stacked overflow. Um, just more examples of fuzzing. So, uh, you know, there are pros and cons to fuzzing. Uh, the biggest pro of fuzzing is that it can be automated, okay? You're programming a computer to do all the hard work for you. You can go and have a drink with your friends all weekend while your computer is crushing away and your power bill is going through the roof to find these bugs. Um, and yeah, you design them. You know, you can uh, design them for specific, like, document formats, specific protocols, and they can kind of, like, vary uh, mathematically go through and kind of iterate over all the corner cases of the protocol, and that's often pretty effective at finding vulnerabilities. Um, yeah, and they are still used. Some people have said, I think 2007, 2008, there were a lot of talks coming out about fuzzing. 
people is like, oh, this is really cool, but it's probably going to die out pretty quickly because everyone's going to do this and all the bugs that can be found this way will be found. But 2012 and this method definitely still does work and people use it all the time to find vulnerabilities like in a PD, Adobe Reader, and stuff like that. Um, con, high false positive. You're going to get a lot of crashes. Only a small subset of those will actually be exploitable. The other con, what I call low quality bugs, uh, generally because if you can program a computer to just fuzz these bugs out, um, you know, if a fuzzer can find it, then someone else can fuzz and find that bug as well. So it's likely the bug isn't going to be very long lived because someone else is just going to come along and fuzz and find that bug as well. Uh, high quality bugs are ones that will go a long time without being noticed, right? You have a bug that you found in some protocol, and it's, it can be five years where you can keep hacking people with that bug, and it's not going to be patched because no one's going to find it because it's really hard to find. Um, small source codes coverage. What I mean by this is that if you have a um, application that has some case statement like if x equals 0, 1, 2, 2, F, A, 3, C, str copy uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, you would probably never find this bug, right? Because the stars would have to align just right, and x would have to be this 32-bit um, value, and you know that's only going to happen one every four million times. So you're probably just never going to find this buffer overflow. If you were reverse engineering, you would see this right away, and you could manually instrument this value of x to be this, and then you get to the vulnerability right away. So. Fuzzing you generally misses stuff like this, so it does have some uh, weaknesses there. Generally, the best approach is to fuzz and reverse engineer simultaneously. Use reverse engineering to improve your fuzzer to make sure you're uh, not missing any corner cases like that. So it's always best to take a multi-pronged approach and not limit yourself. Okay, um, reverse engineering. I'm not going to talk about this too much. Too much. This is a very effective um, means of finding bugs, and it's probably the most rewarding. It feels pretty good when you reverse engineer some proprietary protocol and found a bug in it. Um, but it's kind of beyond the scope of this course because reverse engineering is really pretty hard. And um, I'm thinking about maybe seeing if I can get Matt Briggs to co teach a course with me because he does a lot of reverse engineering where we talk about reverse engineering just for bugs. Um, as an example, if you want to go down this field, uh, down this path, because I'm not going to talk about it much, I would suggest you get Ida Pro, you can get a free version. Um, put your favorite um, closed source proprietary program in there that you want to look for bugs, and then use Ida Pro's cross-reference feature to cross-reference all calls to like string copy and sprint and stuff like that. There you go, that'll get you started. You'll find lots of fun stuff that way. Um, this is a cool example. I saw this talk at Black Hat some number of years ago. That was kind of like automated uh, finding of bugs bit from Microsoft patching. So what he would do is that whenever a Microsoft patch came out, he would do a binary diff between the original binary and that got patched and um, you know the end result of the patching. And what he would do is he would notice sometimes he could spot vulnerabilities this way. For instance, if there was an allocation like a malloc, and he saw that some um, extra arithmetic operations were happening right, right before that, he would sort of um, assume that this meant they were doing balance checking right before the allocation to make sure there's not an integer overflow or something like that. And he basically wrote all these scripts that had a number of heuristics that would um, score updates based on how likely it was they were a vulnerability. Like for instance, if he saw that that string copy was getting changed to an strn copy in the patching, that's you know, a very strong indication that there was a vulnerability they're getting patched. And then um, you know, your bug isn't a zero day, for instance, because it's already been patched, but you know, you still have a, an exploit and it's likely that most people won't apply the patch for some time. Like, so it would take some someone like me or someone I could probably do it in a day, someone better could probably do it, you know, in a couple hours. Or if you're talking about other organizations that take months. To get patched, I mean, you can be exploiting them for months before they actually accept the patch. It takes a long time for organizations to uh, 
get all their patches installed. That's just the way it is. Um, so yeah, that's uh, close. Just a little brief description of closed source auditing. Uh, you don't have to. You can't use. I mean, it's okay to use fuzzing if you're doing open source analysis, right? You shouldn't limit yourself, but you know, don't only use fuzzing. If you have a source code, you should obviously use that as well. But um, if you're looking at something proprietary, something closed source, these are basically the options that you have. Okay, so talk a little bit about um, open source auditing, which is really what this course is about, and hopefully you guys will be doing this some eventually for a sponsor or something like that, or for your own source code. And uh, hopefully this will give you some tips about what to look for there and the quality of your code or the quality of the sponsor. So, show you that. So manual inspection. Um, some people will tell you that no one does manual inspection of source code anymore. That uh, all vulnerabilities are found by crazy three set solvers and blah, 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 stuff like that, and $50,000 source code analysis tools. Not true. Uh, that's just the way it is. Those people are wrong. People still find uh, bugs with manual inspection. In fact, some of the highest quality bugs are still found with manual inspection just because using that method, um, you can find really subtle, subtle bugs that a machine can't find. So there you go. Uh, I've already talked about this. Depending on what you're auditing, you should um, know what you're looking for. Sponsor projects, it's okay to look for string copy, open SSH, don't bother. I'm wasting your time. Okay, so rule number one is don't even bother looking at code that is not touching user controlled data, okay? If there's a vulnerability there, um, you know, just to doing a screen copy on some like administrator configuration file, that doesn't matter. That's not your data. You can only find bugs in the uh, code that is actually handling your data in some way, right? It has to be your data that causes the uh, the memory corruption for it to really be useful, or you have to be able to get to it with uh, with your data, basically. Um, so yeah, you basically want to. Look at your source code for wherever the user input enters it, enters into the program, like a read call on a socket or a fread uh, file or something like that, and then start drilling down on that. You, know, you want to limit your scope. Only look at the uh, parts of the program that pertain to touching your data. Um, yeah, one uh, important thing that a lot of people get lost on, I think, is that when you're auditing source code, put yourself in the programmer's shoes. Try to think of what is this code trying to accomplish? If I was a programmer, how would I design and implement this? And then finally, if I implemented it this way, uh, what would the potential problems be? What I find is that if I'm looking at source code, and I'm thinking of, all right, if I was trying to program this string parsing loop, how would I do it? And then with that in mind, if I've kind of sketched out how I would implement it, it makes a lot more sense about what the um, original programmer was doing in the source code for that loop. And then once you understand the code, it's a lot easier to, uh, to find bugs in it. Um, yeah, I should have mentioned that as well. Obscure code paths, in particular obscure features. Um, remember I told you that if you can hack it, you can crash it. Obscure features often contain vulnerabilities compared to like uh, main you know, features that get used all the time because if the bug is in a code path that is executed all the time, you know, say like your MP3 player, the uh, the code path associated with actually playing MP3s, that code path it hits all the time. So if there's a bug in there, it's likely that the crash has already been seen and reported, and the um, you know the developers are aware of it because that code path gets hits all the time. So it's likely the bug was triggered. Now let's um, talk about the MP2 code path for MP3 player, which never gets used because no one uses it. Use that format or whatever. That one might contain vulnerabilities just because that uh, code path never gets exercised, so no one just uh, is there to see and notice the bugs and crashes and that kind of thing. So always look at obscure features, and those are often where the uh, bugs reside. Um, yeah, here's a couple problem places you want to hear. zone in on. Manual parsing of user input, when you see like a complicated for or while loop that's parsing user data byte by byte and applying some, you know, 
complicated um, state machine kind of logic on it that often has bugs in it, very hard to understand. Um, just kind of go through the loop <coughs> manually, write out the values on a piece of paper, and just figuring out what it's doing, all the corner pieces for the loop. But whenever you see these manual parsing, byte by byte parsing of user data, uh, often a lot of bugs there. Places where balance checking is already occurring, like I showed you before, if there's balance checking there, it's likely the developers know there's potentially a problem, and oftentimes um, they didn't do the balance checking completely sufficiently. There's still uh, some room for error there. User-controlled integers. Uh, this is my personal favorite. Wherever you can see data coming in from the attacker that it uses an integer, like in arithmetic operations, especially in uh, integers that are used for like memory allocations, definitely look at these. Think about what would be the result of this code if my integer was very big, very small, if it was zero, those kind of corner cases. Documentation. Uh, back in the day, this was um, when I used to like looking at open source projects for bugs. It's one of my personal favorites, and I know other people use it as well. You just scan the comments, the documentation for um, things like crash, doesn't work, not right, question marks, XXX, stuff like that. Um, you'd be surprised what you'll find. Oftentimes, the developers are aware that some block of code does not quite work, or that there could be a problem, or you'll see something like, why does this work in question marks? And um, you can look at it and find bugs, because let's be realistic, we've all worked on projects where there was some really gnarly piece of code that did something complicated, and um, no one wanted to touch it because you know, they didn't want to break everything. So they're like, okay, I have no idea what the hell that does. Uh, I don't understand it. I'm just going to leave it alone because um, old Bob you know, from the programming department left the company seven years ago and no one understands this code, but no one wants to break this, so let's just leave it alone. So you'll see comments kind of like that. Uh, those are things, places you definitely want to look at. Also, like on uh, message boards and stuff like that, the documentation will straight up tell you there's currently a bug in this feature. You know, it's crashing if this happens. And sometimes, uh, you know, where the crashes happen, you want to look there and you'll find like a, um, a vulnerability. Yeah, this is uh, one of my favorite slides of the class. This source code was um, the cause of a severe vulnerability that was in Perl for a long time. And it was discovered because someone was auditing the project. And uh, they came along and they saw this comment. And they were like, what? And uh, they saw that comment and they decided to sort of reason about that block of code a little bit more. And then um, because they saw that and sat there and thought on it for a while longer, they created up with the crushing vulnerability for Perl that was around a while ago. So, kind of funny. I mean, it's obvious the, uh, the original developer knew something was up. I guess he thought it was funny. <laughs> uh, yeah, so bugs that have already been patched, oftentimes the, uh, the patch from the vendor was not sufficient. Okay, the vendor will come up and patch something, but they didn't really completely fix the issue. So when something gets patched, that doesn't mean you shouldn't look at it because it's been patched. It means you should especially look at it because there might still be a problem. And um, sometimes you'll see like something like an STR copy buffer overflow gets fixed or something like that. They'll come out with a patch. And it's like, OK, there's a patch for that. And that same instance of the buffer overflow, that same kind of like STR copy logic is kind of like dispersed all throughout their source code, and they go in and they only fix one instance of it, right? They just fix the one that that person wrote the exploit for, but there's still like 100 instances of that same bad block of code. So whenever you see patches coming out for a, um, a product, it's likely that there are other similar bugs out there, or that the patch wasn't even good enough to fix the existing issue. OK, so yeah, I can't really give you a formula for finding bugs. It's something that you have to um, you know, spend time doing. Uh, it's something I'm actively trying to make myself better at. There's obviously there's people out there a lot better than me. But um, really, it comes with experience. You just have to do this and see what you can find. But at the end of the day, you really have to understand the product and the code that you are auditing. If you understand the code better than the original programmers themselves, which is often what it takes, then you will find bugs in the product. Okay, So there's no cheating. You have to spend the time to understand the code. Uh, a lot of times it's not fun, but that's just the way it is. Okay, so 
that was my little bit about finding and looking for software vulnerabilities. Now we're going to talk about exploit mitigation technologies. And I'll try to move through this a little bit quick since you guys uh, wanted to get more on the return to OC stuff. So at this point, people know that software vulnerabilities are never going away. Okay? People have pretty much given up on trying to get rid of bugs. So instead of getting rid of trying to get rid of bugs, they're trying to get rid of exploits. They know that bugs are always going to be there. Uh, they can't get rid of them. But what they can do is implement some stuff in the operating system to make it less likely the exploits will work. Things like ASLR and DEV. ASLR and DEV do not address the underlying issues. They just try to make the exploit that abuses that bug fail. OK, so um, yeah, the, uh, the main feature we've been exploiting in this class is that we can point EIP at data regions in the, in the um, processor. So we're pointing EIP at like the stack, OK? Or we're pointing EIP at the heap which is a little bit strange because these regions typically store only data, not code. However, the PC, the x86 architecture is designed in such a way that it makes no distinction between code or data. You can point EIP wherever you want to, and the CPU is going to try to um, start executing that code. It doesn't matter. So one of the first real exploit mitigation technologies that we saw came out um, to try to remedy that. And it sets some rules on, OK, the EIP can't point at this, or it can't point at this, or at that. In particular, they targeted the stack, and they tried, they basically reprogrammed the Linux page fault handler so that if EIP ever pointed at the stack, it would cause an exception. It wouldn't work. So you couldn't just point the EIP at shell code on the stack. So the problem was that there was no real hardware support for this type of feature, since uh, if the the underlying system made no attempt to discern between code and data. So to force it to do that, you, they had to program this really gnarly hack on top of the page fault handler. As a result, it was kind of buggy, or there's some performance overhead issues, so no one really adopted it. It wasn't accepted to the Linux kernel. Um, so not widely adopted. However, this was back in the day, and now uh, chip providers, even uh, the latest x86 ones have for a while have hardware support for um, determining whether or not uh, it is code or data. So there's hardware support for saying processor can go here or processor cannot go here. This has significantly increased the um, deployment of dev by technologies and no execute stack so that you can't just have shell code on the stack in a local stack buffer and then point EIP at it. The processor will um, has hardware support for preventing that. Here's an example. This is on my, was on my Windows XP laptop. I create some data, just contains no ops. I uh, try to point EIP at it, and then I get an exception, basically, because the processor is saying, no, 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 you're trying to execute a data segment like it's code, and I don't allow that, because that is bad. Yeah, so um, that is pretty much worthless on its own. In my uh, next class, we'll actually build an exploit that bypasses all the uh, exploit mitigations that Windows XP has to offer. Not too hard to do. Uh, it just um, you know makes your life as an exploiter makes your work more important, as you can say. What's funny here is that the guy that actually programmed and suggested the original no execute stack uh, mitigation also came up with the um, the bypass for it. So he developed the attack and the defense. It's all back in you know, like 2000, 2001 time. Pretty smart guy. He had a lot of like uh, really interesting ideas back in 2000, 2001, 1999. And I don't know what happened to him, but a lot of the really cool exploit research back then, he was the source of it. His name was Solar Designer. Pretty good question. Um, so yeah, don't think about this. I, I don't like the way I'm phrasing this. We are going to think about exploiting this without executing any code on the stack. So we're going to think about exploiting this with no shell code, OK? No shell code at all. But we still want it to spawn a shell for us. We've already done this. You just don't realize it. In the original simple login program, we spawned a shell like this 
and we did not execute any shell code, okay? We did not put any shell code on the stack and then point EIP at it. We just returned to this function, go shell, which um, luckily existed in the process address space <coughs> and uh, spawned a shell for us. But I mean, this kind of thing doesn't exist in real applications, right? Well, it turns out that it basically does, okay? And that's what we're going to use. This type of code exists in the standard libc library, which is um, automatically injected into all of your processes in Linux. And Windows has similar stuff and similar DLLs that automatically get put into your process address space. And you can just bounce off those to spawn a shell or do your bidding. It's the beginning of what we call return-oriented programming, which I'll get into a little bit more in exploits too. Okay. So, whether or not you call something like, um, like even if you call the simplest pro, like the simplest function, in fact, pretty much no matter what you do, if you don't call any libc functions, libc is still going to end up in your process. All right. So this was a very simple um, buffer overflow program, smallbuff.c, and in it, you can see the only thing I'm really calling is string copy all string copy, that's the only libc function I'm using. However, all of these other libc functions automatically get put into my process address space. Just because the operating system is automatically putting all of those functions, like this big block of functionality, into my program, even though I don't need, um, I'm only using like 0.01% of it. I still get all this other handy dandy stuff to use. And it turns out, I can just return to one of these functions. So for instance, the system function, the system libc function, will just execute any command we pass as an argument. So if we did system slash bin slash ls, it would execute the ls command, or system slash bin slash sh, it would execute the slash bin slash sh command. So we're just going to return to the system function and orchestrate the stack so that it looks like the argument for system is slash bin slash sh. Okay, and if we do that, we will have spawned a shell and not used any shell code, so we have not executed anything on the stack, and so dev will, have, um, you know, not appear at all. It's all good. Okay, so we need to talk about what the stack is supposed to look like when a function is executed. All right, before we're gonna pull this off. So what we basically want to happen is what you see here on the, um, the right-hand side. We want to return to system and basically execute this, right? So we're going to overflow a, a, overflow a buffer, say return address equal to system, and then we want the system function to execute slash bin slash sh. So how do we set this up? First of all, how do we pass arguments to system? How do we make sure slash bin slash sh is the argument? And the best way to do that is to compile this and then just kind of uh, look at what's going on when this is called legitimately. So with libc, when you pass arguments to functions, you basically just push them onto the stack, okay? So there's only one argument for system, so we just have slash bin slash sh on the stack. Not the actual string, but the pointer to the string, all right? A pointer to slash bin slash sh, not these actual characters on the stack. <clears throat> so, another thing you want to think about is what exactly does a stack look like when we return to a function in that manner? What does the, the function expect the stack to look like? So, when we execute something like the system function, Stack is the function expects the stack to look like this. Okay. 
So you have your argument and your return address. That is what it's expecting the stack to look like. The um, pointer to slash bin slash sh is just because it's assuming that you're pushing that onto the stack before, like you see that call, push eax and call. It expects the return address to get here because it normally expects to have gotten to the system function, or it only expects to have gotten to the system function by means of a call. All right? It's always assuming the call function has pushed the return address onto the stack as well. So when you return to the system function, it expects the stack to be laid out exactly this way. Return address, pointer to slash bin slash sh. So if we're going to return to the system function, get it to execute our shell, we have to make it so that the stack looks exactly like this at the point where we return to the, uh, the system function. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So, what we will be exploiting for this last lab is small buff. And let's use a TCC to compile this. I think I kind of forgot what I'm to use for that, but I use TCC. A uh, small book, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> Here's our game plan. We're going to overflow sixteen bytes to overflow buff. Okay, we're going to completely smash buff just like we've done before. We're going to write four more bytes to overwrite the save frame pointer. It doesn't matter, overwrite a jump. The next four bytes is we're overwriting the return address. So we're going to change, we're going to overwrite the return address with the address of the system function. All right? After the address of the system function, we have to make it look like what I have on the board there. Because what the stack is going to look like is we have Here's what happens, guys. Here's what happens. This is my stack with the main function is executing, right? We have ESP pointing down here. Okay, everyone got that? ESP is down here pointing at the beginning of the. Uh, that's our only local variable on there. Everyone with me so far? Okay. We get to the point where main is going to return. The uh, program starts to peel back the stack frame. Let's cross that out. ESP points to here, restores its saved frame pointer. Plan, we just overwrote this with like B's. So I will just say A, 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 B, 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 B. Overwrote that with junk. We're going to set this. This is still on the stack. We're setting this equals to system, the address of the system function. So pops EDP equals this at this point. The stack moves up. We're just still in that main function's epilogue, peeling back a stack frame. Now we're at the point where the main function is going to return, and we take control of EIP. All right. We do pop EIP via the return instruction. ESP ends up here. We are now executing system, so EIP. Equals system, and look what the stack looks like. We have a um, bogus return address. I should have put bogus. Because this is something that we put on the stack, a 
Okay. We have a pointer to slash bin slash sh that we will put on the stack as well via our overflow. And then the return instruction is made EIP equal to system. Systems view of the stack is this, which is exactly what it's supposed to look like. It has this bogus return address that we had put on the stack for it. And then a pointer to slash bin slash sh for its argument. And then bam. It is just like we have done a call. So we have turned our vulnerable program into one that is called system slash bin slash sh. So if this is running as user ID root, we would have a root shell on system. So this is what we're going to do to exploit small bug. First, we have to discover a few things we have to find out. One. Address of system. Two. Address of slash bin slash sh. Say address, you mean the <coughs> hexadecimal code of that string? Uh, not the code for that string, but an actual pointer to this string. Okay, so let's assume that OX11223344 stored that address as this string. We would want the actual 11223344. So you have to store it and then give the address? Yes. I'll talk about that in a second. Three. Okay, what else is unknown for us here? What to use for the return address? Bogus return address? Okay, who can tell me what the address of system is? What you should do? is because we are not in an ASLR environment, the address of system will be the same each time you run the program. Okay, so compile small buff, set a breakpoint in the main function, run it, and then do like um, x slash i system or something like that, and it will tell you the address of the system symbol. the answer. I want you all to confirm that you get the same thing though. Question Keith? Um, X slash I and then system, the word system. Yeah. They can figure that out that it's referring to libc. System. Yes. Mine's just a no symbol system. Did you uh, run the program and set a breakpoint in the middle? Yes. Did you have the command you used? Um, breakpoint and then I just did X. Not X slash I did X slash I system. Yeah. Okay, all right. All right, so what is the address that you guys all got? Actually, let's just start with uh, Mike and see if everyone got the same thing. What did you get, Mike? 890CEC83. 890CEC83. What did you guys get? Did you get the same one? Ah, interesting. Um, here, Mike, restart the program and then do the same command and tell us what you get again. Thank you. 
Okay, I want everyone to do that. Restart the program and do the command again and just make sure you get the same address. Just want to make sure that I didn't accidentally uh, leave on SLR on these VMs. Dave, same yep. address? Okay, so I'll just write down that. I'll use Mike's address then, but this will be different depending on the address of the system for uh, your particular virtual machine. Just keep that in mind. Okay, pointer to slash pin slash sh. Anyone have any ideas here? This one's kind of tricky. So um, it turns out that this string would just exist in the libc library somewhere, like in slash, you know, the slash bin slash sh string just appears somewhere in the libc library and you can use the pointer to the string there. However, to make things more clear, notice that I put um, some code in here to tell me what the address of the first command line argument is, or a second command line argument. So if I do small dub slash bin slash sh like this, the address of slash bin slash sh is OXPFFF F796. Right? So this gives us a, a free pointer to the slash bin slash sh string. Now in a real exploit, you would go digging through the application for a, you know, a legitimate pointer to slash bin slash sh, just to make things more uh, clear, or just manually forcing in the slash bin slash sh string, and the program tells us what the pointer is. Everyone with me so far, Keith? So, so I'm just to understand what happens, the fact that you wrote that string on the command line and, um, and put it in an argument in a program, it automatically <coughs> allocated a yes. memory spot and yeah. it gave you that. Exactly. Yeah, the operating system is kind enough to do that for us. Yeah. The operating system does many nice things for us, some of which can be used for exploitation. So, my address here, and this will change as you're working on your payload, so make sure you're not just uh, keeping a static value here, it is going to change a little bit. Bogus return address, what should I do for this? Anyone have any ideas? It'd be nice to put it right at the end of the main where it returns back normally. Yeah, that would be interesting. Um, that would probably work out. I, you should try that. Um, this can't be anything, and basically what this means is that after you exit the system slash pen slash sh, so like if you type exit and your shell spawns from that, it would crash because it would try to jump to a bogus value. Uh, what you commonly see is put the address of the exit here. So whatever that address is for you, you can put that in there. It doesn't matter that you use the bogus value. So I want you guys to work on exploiting small buff as your last lap of the day. Um, and spend a few minutes on it based on the information I've given you here before I start about working out the payload. Myself on the door. I'm going to see if you guys are going to go for it. I'll see if you guys can get it on your own. Can you print out your value for system? Yeah, sure. Sorry, we got something messed up a little bit. The address of system isn't actually 890CEC83, right? It's actually the one on the left, uh, B7EBCF40. Got it. Yeah. Sorry, that was my bad. I should have <coughs> got that one.
for those of you that really like this material and you want to um, learn more about return oriented programming, all these reasons about it, I would challenge you to uh, right now you know how to successfully chain two loop C calls together, system and an exit, since we're forcing in that return address. Think about how you would make it execute three. Is anyone uh, really lost and needs some more guidance for us? Everyone have a general idea of what we're trying to do here. Keith, got you know, I forgot about on the stack when you declare a local variable if it's a char, uh, what's the size of the uh, placement on the stack? So this one is 16 bytes, right? Right, well, that's the size of the. Of the yeah. So that whole, it's not. An address that is just put on there? So no, there's actually 16 bytes of data allocated on the stack. You'll see like a sub ESP 16 to okay. create that uh, 16 byte region of space on the stack. Okay, now, if you were in heap land and you did like char buff equals malloc or alloc, then it would just be a pointer. But in the stack, the stack is actually adjusted to create the root. Here's what you guys will do. I know this part is a little bit confusing. What I would do is you have your program. I would go ahead and just make argv1 always slash bin slash sh. That way, you know, you always have your pointer to slash bin slash sh in the process address space somewhere. And then here is where you put your payload. This is going to be like the, you know, cat payload, which contains 16 bytes of A, 4 bytes of junk of right the frame pointer, the address of system, bogus return address, and then the pointer to slash bin slash sh string. So you should have used the one that we found in through the OS. Is there a deep debugging by that? No, you can use that. Yeah, okay. you use that address of uh, so you found system, the address of system, and maybe exit that way, right? So you will use that address. Uh, do you guys want me to start working through uh, my solution for this, or do you want me to give you more time to look at it? Whatever. Notice that. One thing to notice, guys, is that the address of the slash bin slash sh string is going to change depending on the size of all your command line arguments. So in this case, there's a one byte string for the first, for the second command line argument, then a three byte, then a six byte. You notice that shifts the addresses around each time. All right. So if the argument sizes stay the same, though, the addresses stay the same. So if you de develop your payload. And use the address of slash bin slash sh when your payload stream was only 50 bytes long or something like that, then your address for slash bin slash sh will change somewhat. Just FYI. So, sorry guys, the, uh, I was not looking at the source code. As Shane just pointed out, the uh, slash bin slash sh string is actually supposed to be the second command line argument, just because the way the thing is programmed. So yeah, like that, because the string copy is coming from um, the first command line argument, not the second one. So my bad there. So a simpler version of the return oriented programming thing that you can try is um, you can call the system function, right? You can pass whatever argument you want to it. You can also call the exit function. However, when um, about that, see, exit would be. No, no, the same. So, Dave, think about how you would try to um, chain three libc calls together. So, it is right now. You can do system then exit because you're applying, you're supplying that exit uh, system call. You know, right here. So you can call system then exit. That would force you to call a third libc function.
worksheet. So for those of you curious about like that more advanced mitigation bypasses and return-oriented programming, I would suggest to you as a good paper to get started, uh, if I can find it. Google for advanced return into libc exploits. Uh, it's a really cool paper. There's another issue you would have with this. Is let's imagine that for whatever reason you need to return to a system call that has to have null bytes or something like that. How would you deal with that? So for instance, when you're bypassing dev in Windows, one of the things you do is you return to a call called uh, like virtual protect, which can change permissions on the stack to be executable. And um, that function, virtual protect, takes like four arguments, and many of them will need lots of null bytes. So what you could do is if you're talking about a payload that could have no null bytes, is you just hard code some bogus arguments. Like, uh, let's say one of your arguments, arguments used to be ff000000. You would just make the argument in your payload ff, 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 and you would chain together multiple calls to like sprintf or string copy to manually write those null bytes into your payload as it's executing, stuff like that. And the return to libc, uh, advanced return to libc paper talks about all those things. In general, if you like this type of thing, there's a huge volume of uh, great papers that you want to read in the uh, Frack magazine. So you should check that out. All right, so that was pretty much the last slide, guys. Um, I want to say a couple more things to, uh, to wrap up the class. If anyone is still working, guys, first of all, did, did everyone get the, um, the shell response? You got it? Okay. So, um, moral of the story, DEF, no execute stack on its own is worthless, all right, easily bypassed. Um, let's open my slides here. And the main reason for that is the attacker can predictably know where the address of the system function is whenever the process executes. So ASLR is all about trying to, um, you know, prevent that from happening. So if I turn on ASLR, which you can actually do on those systems by typing um, this command. So if you su root, and this use root as the password. Do that, that'll re-enable ASLR on the system, okay? And then if you tried to redo your payload, it would fail. Reason being, the address of the system would have moved around. That's what ASLR is all about, moving stuff around. You see these addresses are still the same. But notice if you look more closely, they're still pretty similar, right? These addresses are only changing in like eight bits. It's really only eight bits that are changing. So uh, one of the main weaknesses of ASLR is a uh, implementation weakness. Usually things are just not very random and you can uh, kind of guess where things are. In this case we're talking about trying to exploit some local vulnerability. Only 8 bits are changing so you only have to try probably 100, 150 times where you guess right and then you win. So ASLR certainly is not perfect. Um, it also randomizes stack addresses as you can see so it'd be hard to guess where your shell code is but things are still somewhat similar. You can see here, this is uh, something I got from Microsoft and it shows you sort of the exploit mitigations they offer depending on the operating system. So um, 
ASLR, not available in XP, DEP, you already know about that, but DEP on its own is worthless without ASLR because you can just return to these functions that you know the address of, game over. Um, I'll just say Windows 7, just because it has ASLR, the main way people bypass ASLR in Windows 7 is that, like with DEP, your module can just opt out of um, ASLR and then the options will randomize it. Its functions will appear at the same address every time you load it. And um, guess how many DLLs of Flash are opt into ASLR or something like that? I'll leave that as an experiment for, uh, for you guys to take on. But it turns out that a lot of modules out there don't opt into stuff like ASLR. And you can abuse those to uh, bypass those medications. Is the default to opt in or to opt out? Uh, the default, it depends on your compiler settings. I mean, but like just install. Yeah. So it's like. System wide, you can set it so that you kind of have like settings on the system level and the binary level. The, system, the binary can say like um, opt in or opt out, and the system can say like everything has to opt in. If it's not ASLR compatible, I'm just not going to load this thing. Or it can say like opt into ASLR unless it explicitly says not to and stuff like that. When you look at any third party um, application, you know, of any substantial size, and a lot of them will opt out of these um, things like that and ASLR and so forth, so they just won't be applied to those DLLs. And those are the things that are used to bypass uh, ASLR windows and deck windows. So, and if we go over that, and exploits too. Basically, in exploits too, I give you a vulnerable binary, turn on every single exploit mitigation Windows XP has to offer, and then I load the flash DLL into that uh, vulnerable executable, and then you just use the Flash DLL to bypass every uh, mitigation since Flash is not moving. Wait until June to see that. Um, yeah, so not very random. These things, you can kind of break them with brute force or discover them with information disclosure vulnerabilities like format strings and stuff like that. Um, another big issue is that with ASLR, not everything is randomized, just kind of like the uh, the base offset for the processes is, is randomized and everything is the same distance apart based on that initial random offset. So in this case, system and exit are both random, random addresses is changing, but the difference between the two functions is the same. So for instance, if I was able to discover the address of just one function of libc, I'd automatically enter the address of the random function of libc. So ASLR obviously has a lot of um, issues. It can stop some exploits from working, but um, you know, there are serious issues with the implementations that can be uh, abused to overcome that particular mitigation. So ASLR and DEP are designed to work uh, in concert together. DEP forces you into like a return-oriented programming scenario, like return to libc, and ASLR prevents you from knowing, um, reliably knowing where the code is to return to. But, um, you know, even when these two things combine, like I hinted at, it's really just making the attacker's life harder. This will render some scenarios unexploitable, but a large number of them are still exploitable and just take a lot more work to uh, develop a successful payload point. That's the end. All right, so uh, thanks, guys, for coming.